Hi all, Pastor Matt Kennedy here, really looking forward to delving into the Word of God with you guys again this week. Preacher Warner Pigeon once shared a story about an audacious rescue that happened on the 5th of August 2010. The San Jose copper mine in the Atacama Desert in Chile collapsed, trapping 33 men in the darkness. The world and their relatives, they all feared that there was no hope. The depth of the mine, the lack of food and water, the absence of any signs of life, they all pointed to a terrible, sad end. But after signs of life were detected, an audacious rescue attempt was launched. Starting from the surface of the desert uh, during bright daylight, drills began to bore a narrow hole down into the, dark, into the darkness. After meticulous planning, but recognising many risks, a rescue capsule called Phoenix was sent down into the depths to rescue the 33 men. One by one, the men stepped into their rescue capsule and they were delivered to the surface to shouts of jubilation and joy that they had been feared dead, but every man that stepped into that capsule was saved alive and well. Think on this though. After meticulous planning and very aware of the cost, God launched an audacious rescue plan. For many people, life can seem dark and without hope, a bit like being trapped in a mine. But similar to that capsule that descended into the depths of that collapsed mine to rescue the trapped miners, so it is that God came down from above into the depths of this world to rescue us. Jesus is the rescue capsule. And when we place ourselves into his care, he lifts us up inch by inch, moment by moment, in order that we might be saved. Undaunted, not intimidated or discouraged by difficulty, danger or disappointment. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that uh, you would give me the words to speak in each of us, Lord, myself included, the ears to hear. I just ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. So I wanted to welcome everyone as we look to finish off our Undaunted series, as we look at the last couple of passages in 2 Timothy. Today is going to be our second last sermon in this series, as we look at 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 17, in a sermon that I've entitled, The Lord Rescued Me. Here we see Paul continue to share with Timothy in a number of different areas that we'll touch on today. Let's work our way through now. So if you have your Bibles there, please open them to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we're going to start at verses 10, or verses 10 and 11 is what we'll look at right now. 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 11. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution, suffering, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Illicum and Lystra, uh, the persecutions that I endured. Here Paul taught, points Timothy, his protege, towards the things that he has taught and the life that he himself has lived, even in the face of much persecution and suffering. Uh, Timothy can know that the things that Paul has taught are trustworthy and they're not just made up examples, but something that Paul himself has lived through and lived as uh, and he's been a great example for, even in the face of extreme trials. When it came to persecutions and suffering, I mean, Paul had become well acquainted with how to deal with such things. I mean, interestingly, Paul, when he was known as Saul before Christ uh, revealed himself to him, uh, he was one of those who perpetrated the suffering of others, specifically those who were followers of Jesus. He started with Stephen, as we see in Acts 7, 57 and 58, where it says, At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragging him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of the young man named Saul. Straight after the stoning of Stephen, Saul then became Christian's number one enemy. Uh, Acts 8.3, but Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them into prison. Saul we even went uh, further afield, going out from Jerusalem, heading with murderous intent to Damascus to find and capture the Christians that were there as well. Uh, he went there with an intent to chain them up and to drag them back to Jerusalem, where they could be tried and put to death. 
uh, like what had happened to so many of Jesus' followers in Jerusalem. Uh, but the Lord had other ideas and he confronted Saul and Saul became a believer with, uh, with that change. Also, it changed his name to Paul, so to reflect that change. But with that change, the Lord also said that Paul himself would have to suffer many things. And we see this in Acts 9, 15 and 16, where it says, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, it gives us a great summary of the sufferings that he did indeed have to face. So where Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I've received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers." I have laboured and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Beside everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul had suffered more often in more ways than anyone else for the gospel of Jesus Christ by this point. When Paul spoke on perseverance through suffering, he spoke on the subject with an air of authority because of his per own personal uh, position, his own personal experience in regards to these things. He knew what it was to be persecuted, what it was to truly suffer for the gospel of Christ. But he also knew that there were temporal, that these were temporal things and that he had something much better to look forward to. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of a story that I read in uh, Our Daily Bread. The famous preacher D.L. Moody told uh, this story about a Christian woman who was always bright and cheerful and optimistic, even though she was confined to her room because of illness. She lived in an attic apartment on the fifth floor of an old rundown building. Now, a friend apparently decided to visit her one day and brought along another woman, a person of great wealth. Uh, since there was no elevator, the two ladies began the long climb upwards. When they reached the second floor, the well-to-do woman commented, what a dark and filthy place. Her friend replied, it's better higher up. When they arrived at the third landing, the remark was made, things look even worse here. Again, the reply, it's better higher up. The two women finally reached the attic level where they found the bedridden saint of God. A smile on her face radiated the joy that filled her heart. Although the room was clean and flowers were on the windowsill, the wealthy visitor could not get over the stark surroundings in which this woman lived. She blurted out, it must be very difficult for you to be here like this. Without a moment's hesitation, the shut-in responded, it's better higher up. She was not looking at temporal things uh, with an eye of face fixed on the eternal. She had found the secret of true satisfaction and contentment. That's why the Apostle Paul could say in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul knew that while he was still here on earth, he would have the privilege to live his life for Christ. While he, if he was to die, death would hold no terrors for him, as he would be in a better place, in the very presence of the Lord and Saviour. Um, how about you? How about you? Could you say this? Are you willing to endure persecution and suffer for Jesus in this life, knowing the gain that you will have in the next because, what, because of what Jesus has done for you and I. How about you? As Paul writes uh, this letter to Timothy, he points out clearly that 
He wasn't just uh, left to flounder in the depths of his suffering, but that God himself had rescued him. We see this uh, in the second half of the verse where Paul says, Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. Um, a chaplain by the name of uh, David Huss tells the story of a boy who came home one hot afternoon, anxious to take a cool swim in the pond be behind his home. Uh, he lived in South Florida, uh, so taking a quick dip was a common way to cool off. Um, he was so anxious to get in the water, he didn't even go inside to change his clothes. He just raced for the pond, dropping his shoes and his shirt and his socks along the way. His mother spotted him diving off the dock, and she went outside to check on him. As she watched her son swim towards the middle of the lake, she also spotted an alligator moving from the far shore towards her son. She began screaming the warning and the boy stopped in mid-swim and he finally understood the danger and began racing back toward the dock. Just as he reached her, the alligator reached him. It was a tug of war from, uh, from a mother's worst nightmare. Uh, from the dock, she pulled his arms. From the water, the alligator held onto his legs. The water was quickly stained with blood. A farmer driving by, he heard the screams and he ran to help. And he shot the alligator and helped the mother call for help. And the boy, he survived. And after several weeks of hospitalisation, he was ready to talk with news reporters. The reporter asked the child if he could see where the alligator had bitten him. And with typical uh, pride of a boy, he showed off his healing wounds to the interested reporter. But wait, said the boy, look at these. And with that, he showed the reporter the scars that were on his arms. I have great scars on my arms too. I have them because my mum wouldn't let go. Friends, this is exactly what Jesus did for us. The difference, the difference being that he wears the scars. Satan, just like that alligator, had a hold of you and I, and he was looking to drag us into the abyss with us. But Jesus was there. He could see what was happening, and he held his hands out to rescue us from that wicked servant. Jesus, just like the mum in the story, wouldn't let go. But rather than us wearing the scars on our own arms and legs, Jesus has them. See his hands. See his feet. See his side. Those scars are the proof that Jesus persisted until the end, saving us from our sin, restoring us into a relationship with the Father in heaven. His scars were the necessity for our own salvation. They are how we, as his people, can say so boldly that the Lord rescued me. As Christians, we have the comfort of knowing that whatever we face in life, whether it be sickness or health, or riches or poorness, success or failure, Jesus has said that he will always be with us. We will never be left alone. He promises that in the very last verse of the Gospel of Matthew, when he says in Matthew 28, 20, and surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We see this also reiterated by the writer of Hebrews when he says in Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a wonderful promise that we as followers of Jesus can take hold of. Jesus will be with us through thick and thin. There is nothing that anyone ultimately can do in this life that we will need to fear because Jesus will never let go. In fact, Jesus said in Luke 12, 4 to 5, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I warn you, uh, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That is, don't fear what other people can do to you. Don't fear about that side of stuff. Instead, fear God. For he is the one who holds all authority over your life, death, and your eternal future. And Paul has good reason to bring all of this up. With Timothy, Because as we have seen in Paul's earlier writings to Timothy, persecution as a believer is just not, it's not just a future possibility, it's an absolute certainty. 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, anyone 
So everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. As we see in the previous chapter, Paul warns that there are terrible times ahead as we endure the last days. Part of that package is that we will see a dramatic increase in sin and lawlessness uh, in those days, which is why Paul warns in the next verse, uh, 2 Timothy 3.13, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Anyone been watching the news this week and seeing what's happened in America? Amazing. The result being that all who follow Jesus and live a godly life will be persecuted for their faith and for their godly stand. Friends, for you to endure this persecution, you will have to stand firmly on God's solid, solid foundation. Uh, as we saw in 2 Timothy uh, 19, 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Despite all that is happening, despite the evil talk of godless people trying to turn people from the truth, nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. This is why we must set our feet into God's solid foundation. It will never move. It will never move. Um, our God is consistent. The depth of his foundation through the Holy Spirit will give us the strength that we need to live that godly life that we have been called to do, even in the face of persecution. So how do we respond to this? It's all good and well for me to say to you to place your foundations in God. But how do we do that? How do we achieve something that which it can seem a little bit like pie in the sky? Uh, it's a Kind of like pie in the sky type of statement. Well, thankfully, God knew that we would need some form of practical aspect to this. So he inspires Paul to write the following verses in explanation. 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 15. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been com become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Basically, Paul is saying here to Timothy, you've seen me teach these truths of the gospel and you know them to be true. And you know for me to be a faithful servant, even when tested. Trust in these things, but also put them into practice. Be a faithful follower of Jesus, walking in the ways that you know are right, before the Lord, have nothing to do with evil men and women who are progressively sinking further and further and further into sin and depravity. And the same is true of us, guys. We too can look to Paul and we can trust in his teaching. We too can take what we have learnt from people who are worthy of our trust. People who you know, for instance, who love the word of God and who teach or preach faithfully from the scriptures. People who are willing to endure persecution for the truth of the gospel. People whose lives line up with what they proclaim. We also should walk in the way that we know to be right and pleasing to the Lord. And we too, we too should steer clear of those people who revel in sin and who don't think twice about doing evil. But Paul goes even further than this as he again points uh, towards the importance of knowing and trusting the Holy Scriptures, which Timothy had known since he was an infant. Paul then re again reiterates that the Scriptures point towards Jesus and hold in them the key to salvation, being the gospel story about what Jesus has done for you and I. Paul then moves on to verse 16 where he says, uh, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That's a big thing, isn't it? Uh, these words that we read in our Bible came from the very one who created this universe. He, it's just a, an amazing thing. You think about things like the Milky Way, 
So the Milky Way contains over 200 billion stars and apparently has enough dust and gas floating around that God could make a billion more if he wanted to use the few leftovers that he's got there. We're part of the Milky Way. Uh, we kind of sit on the edge of it. Our solar system lies about 30,000 light years from the galactic center and is about 20, 000, uh, sorry, 20 light years above the plane of the galaxy. And this was created by God. Think of uh, Andromeda, um, a spiral galaxy approximately 2.5 million light years from Earth and the nearest major galaxy to the Milky Way. Its name stems from the area of the sky in which it appears, uh, the constellation of Andromeda. So this is, was something else that was created by God. Um, think of the Pinwheel Galaxy, a grand design spiral galaxy that is estimated to be approximately 21 million light years away and 170 light year, 170,000 light years across, compared to the Milky Way's 250,000 light year di diameter. The, the Pinwheel Galaxy is estimated to be home to around 1 trillion stars, more than double that of the Milky Way. Uh, its asymmetrical shape is due to gravitational forces from surrounding smaller galaxies as well. Friends, the point of this, the point of this, um, of looking at these or just talking about these things in the, our universe is to remind us, every one of us, um, that it was... The one who spoke and breathed every one of these amazing things into being is the same being through whom all scriptures were God breathed. Uh, while God chose us to use, uh, while God chose to use human authors to write the different books with their own styles and personal perspectives, ultimately the source of the information that they have written comes from God, not from their human creativity and this and, and this is the God that created anything and everything that you can see it's just amazing therefore when God says that they are useful the scriptures are useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness he can be trusted in this he can be trusted in this and we can and should use the scriptures in such a way uh, those scriptures that we all have and hold and read and live by come from the very one who created everything and everything that exists comes through him, from him. And we should remember that as we pick up those scriptures and look through those scriptures that everything that is came from the same person that wrote these scriptures. 2 Timothy 3.17 uh, also says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So two final things here. Paul tells Timothy that the person who studies and applies the scriptures to their life in such a way will have everything that they require, um, in his case, in Timothy's case, to effectively lead uh, others as a minister. But also it's how Christian maturity can be gained generally by everyone. And as Christian maturity sets in, it will also show Timothy and, or, and allow Timothy and you and I uh, to effectively live our lives by the faith that we possess, sorry, by the faith that we profess and, and do every good work that we have been called to do. God rescued us. His uh, love and grace uh, was there for a purpose. Hey, never forget that we were once like the miners in our opening story, trapped with no hope and in utter darkness. Everything pointed towards a very, very sad end for us because we were separated from God. And yet God reached down and rescued us from our sin, making us his children of light. And we know this because we can trust what God tells us in his scriptures. Friends, recognize that you have been rescued by God and that it cost him dearly to do it. Read, study, and trust in the scriptures as they are God-breathed and absolutely reliable. And in response to what Jesus has done for you, respond through obedience and come to a maturity in Christ so that you can be equipped for every good work.
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you that you are um, the one who rescued us. Lord, that your son, that you that your son came down into the depths of this earth, Lord, and, and became one of us and lived that sinless life, Lord, and then died for us, um, died so that we could have life, and Lord, rose again in victory. Lord, I just ask that for each of us, Lord, that we would recognise you for, again for who you are, Lord, that when we look and open up the scriptures that we would see that they are God-breathed, the very person, the very God who, who created all things, those galaxies and suns and, and different, the earth and everything that's on it, Lord. That, that it was all created by the same person who wrote this book for us, the Bible, the scriptures. Lord, I just ask that you would help us to, to recognize that, to see that. And Lord, that we would take advantage of that and read your word. Lord, I just ask that for each of us that you would really touch our hearts and our minds and that we would see the importance of, of reading your word, Lord, not, not for the sake of just gaining knowledge, but so that our relationship with you can just be continually built and we can become mature in Christ. Lord, we just ask this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.